Have you ever faced a decision that was so emotional and you were so conflicted inside that it was virtually impossible to discern between what does God want and what do I want, right? Well, today, our Heavenly Father is going to help us during those times when we are so conflicted that he is going to help us realize how much he is working and moving in our behalf from the background to guide us. And by the way, it's going to take a ton of pressure off. In fact, I remember the very first time I faced a situation where I had to make a decision like that. <clears throat> I was the pastor at a small country church in Gatesville, Texas. And I loved that church and I loved the people. They were so kind. They were so wonderful. And it was a wonderful experience. And I really loved that. I really knew that God had called me to be there. But in year four of me being the pastor, an opportunity came up for me to come to Katy as a youth pastor. Now, it will be a step down for me as far as position goes, but it would be in a community that I really loved, and it would give me a chance to work with the senior pastor who had been my senior pastor growing up as a kid. So I was torn. Like, I didn't know what, I didn't know what God really wanted me to do because on one hand, I really loved where I was, and I had felt like God had called me there, and I, and I hadn't heard him tell me to leave yet. And on the other hand, I loved this new other community and I really loved my senior pastor and wanted to work with him. So like, what do I do? And as I prayed about it, it was so difficult for me to discern what does God want and what do I want because I was just so emotionally tied up with both places. And so I wasn't sure. And then to make matters worse, the people in my life that I would seek counsel from, they were all telling me like, well, yeah, I can kind of see both sides. I don't really know. I'm like, thanks, y'all no help. So I, got it. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I was praying and praying and praying and praying and literally nothing. You ever been in a situation like that? Yeah, I think all of us have. I mean, we've been so close to a decision. Like we're just so emotionally tied up in it, so invested in it, that sometimes it's hard to hear God through all of the emotion. And it's in those moments, sometimes sometimes God can feel so distant. Sometimes we'd be like, God, where are you? Like, I need to know what it is that you want me to do. There's a lot right on this, and I don't want to get it wrong. So God, where are you in all this? Well, fortunately for us, a young Jewish girl named Esther found herself in a very similar situation, so emotionally tied up in a decision that she wasn't sure what it is that God wanted her to do and what she wanted to do and even what other people wanted her to do. But what happens to her gives us incredible guidance of what God wants us to do when we find ourselves in that position. So go ahead and grab your message notes, grab your Bible, and we're gonna start in Esther chapter four. But before we actually begin, in those passages, there are two common temptations that we need to avoid, okay? And these are your first feelings, so write these down. Here's the first one to avoid. The first temptation we need to avoid is the temptation to turn Esther into a hero story. Listen, Esther is not the hero of this book of the Bible. God is. And he's always been the hero. But... If you remember, God is not mentioned anywhere in this entire book. His name is not mentioned anywhere. But at the same time, the point of the book of Esther is that God is always at work moving silently and powerfully in the background. And the same is true in our lives. You know, when we can't sense God, when we can't feel God, when it feels like he's so distant, listen, God is always moving silently and powerfully in the background. And so the temptation for us is that, you know, when we make one of these, have one of these emotional dilemma decisions and we end up making a decision and it works out, the temptation is to pat ourselves on the back and be like, oh, I like I knew it the whole time. Like I, I knew I was making the right decision. Man, this is so great. Wow, look what, look what I did. No, no, no. Every good 
thing you have in your life is because God is the one who silently and powerfully was leading you from the background to make the decision. And so you are not the hero of your own story. God is. And he always has been. And he always will be. Just like he's the true hero in the book of Esther. The other temptation we need to avoid is this. Number two, write this one down. It's the temptation to minimize the danger and confusion of the situation. Look, make no mistake, the danger of genocide was very real for Esther and the Jewish people. And I, I think sometimes that, you know, we're in such a hurry to, you know, pick out some principles and some lessons in the book of Esther that we just so quickly gloss over the depth of anti-Semitism that was there. And, and by the way, it is ugly. And it's not like anti-Semitism, you know, the hatred of Jews isn't alive and well today. I mean, all you have to do is look at what was going on on, most, on many college campuses this last semester. And just like it doesn't, didn't make any sense then, it doesn't make any sense now. Listen, and the reason it doesn't make any sense is because it's not logic-driven. It's spiritually driven. Now, before we just dive down deep into that little rabbit hole, I actually want to get back to the book of Esther. Um, so we just need to move on. Uh, and by the way, in case you haven't been here, let me just give you the quick catch up on what's going on so that when we start in chapter four, you'll be up to speed. Um, a beautiful young Jewish girl named Esther has been chosen queen. However, her identity as a Jew has been kept secret. Well, an evil noble named Haman, who is also an advisor to the king, has convinced King Xerxes to issue a decree that all of the Jews in the Babylonian Empire, the vast empire, are to be killed on a single day 11 months away. And so... That's, that's, that's the situation. And basically, it's going to effectively exterminate all, of the, all the Jews in the known world. It will be genocide. Now, why is Haman so bent on destroying the Jews? Well, it begins when Esther's older cousin Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman, a noble. And it infuriates Haman so much, he vows not just to kill Mordecai, but to kill all the Jews, because none of the Jews would really bow down to him. And so it's at this point that we pick up the action in chapter four. So grab your notes, grab your Bible, and let's ask this question. How do I respond in this moment? And by this moment, I mean, how do I respond when I'm so emotionally conflicted and can't tell God's voice from my own emotions? Like, you know, what do I do? Well, there are four questions we can ask ourselves that can help clear the fog. Here's the first question, write this down. Do my actions put others in harm's way? Do my actions put others in harm's way? Look at how chapter four opens. It says, when Mordecai learned all that had been done, and by that he's referencing the decree to kill all of the Jews. Mordecai immediately knows that Haman is behind all of this. Essentially, Mordecai's decision not to bow down to Haman has inflamed the situation so much so that it has put all of the Jewish people in harm's way. And so for us, like when we're facing an emotional decision, what can we do to not further inflame the situation and maybe perhaps put other people in harm's way? Well, there's two guiding principles for us that we get from this book. And write, here, these are your bullet points. Write this one down. The first is, don't let the conflict go unresolved. Don't let the conflict go unresolved. Listen, if you've had a conflict with someone or they've had a conflict with you, make it right. Listen, don't be the kind of person who makes an emotional decision and just walks out. Just walks out on a job, walks out on a friendship, walks out on a situation. Don't, don't be that kind of person. Don't do that. Listen, God doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to resolve it. Now listen, later on, he might still ask you to leave that situation. Or he might help you realize, hey, I can't be 
you know, in that friendship any longer, or I can't work in this, you know, situation or this company or with this team any longer, or I can't trust this person or this family member or whoever it is like I used to. He might lead you to all that, but the time to decide that is later. But for now, God wants you to resolve the conflict first, and then he will lead you to make a decision. Maybe you can't hear him is because he wants you to resolve that conflict, and later on, he will tell you what to do. In fact, I want you to look what Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter five when it comes to conflict. Jesus says this, he says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Jesus says, settle matters quickly. Not later, now. Not after you've left the company, not after you've put some distance between yourself and like whoever. Settle it quickly. And it's only afterwards that God will lead you to whatever next step you need to take. And listen, by the way, God might lead you to stay. So you need to settle those matters quickly. Okay? The second principle is this. Is I got to remember that my conflict doesn't just affect me. My conflict doesn't just affect me. See, Mordecai thought that the conflict was just simply between himself and Haman. It's only later that he realizes that it is now widened to include all of the Jewish people. And see, that's the thing about conflict. It never stays between two people, does it? Never. No, no. Listen, when you're in conflict with somebody, your family feels it. Your close friends can sense it. The people, other people at your office they know about it, they, they, and they can feel it too. In fact, the people who are friends with the person you're in conflict with, they know about it because chances are that person's talking about it with their friends. So conflict never stays between two people, and the longer you wait to resolve it, the wider the circle is of people who are affected by it. So settle it quickly. That's what Jesus tells us to do, Okay? And sometimes the Lord, you know, allows that to happen so that we can settle it and and get it resolved. Okay, all right. So if I can't tell if it's God or if it's me and I'm in this emotional, you know, decision and I, I I just can't tell, what else does God want me to do? What other questions can I ask to help clear the fog? Well, here's the second one. Write this one down. Is my reaction in line with God's heart? Is my reaction in line with God's heart? Look how chapter four continues. It says, and I want you to underline this first phrase. Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. Underline that. And went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached there, there was great mourning among the Jews, with, and I want you to put a, put a box around this, with fasting and weeping and lamenting. We're going to come back to that in a second. And many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. Now, look at that first part I had to underline. It says, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth. Like, whoa, what in the world does that mean? Okay, well, in Old Testament times, when someone would demonstrate despair or deep loss, a lot of times they would tear their clothes in and then they would put on sackcloth. Well, what in the world is sackcloth? Well, it was a dark brown, coarse material, okay? Kind of like a potato sack, okay? Think about like a burlap sack. Now, it wasn't a burlap sack, but it would be kind of like that. It was rough, and it was meant to be worn without any undergarments on, and so it would be rough on the skin. It would irritate the skin, and it was basically a sign to everybody that the wearer was so emotionally distraught and in such emotional pain that they were paid, that they paid no attention to personal comfort or appearance. Hence, they would also cover themselves with ash. And so that's the situation and what was going on here. And so, like, how does this apply to us? Well, Again, these are your two bullet points. Here's the first one. Is that my response should mirror the emotions of the moment. My response should mirror the emotions of the moment. See, Mordecai's response mirrored the emotions of the moment. It was, it was perfectly appro- appropriate for him to cover himself with sackcloth and ashes. In fact, if he hadn't done that, people probably thought he was being fake, you know? 
And when we face a dilemma that's emotional and we're deeply conflicted, it's perfectly appropriate for our emotions to mirror the moment. So listen, it's okay to cry. It's okay to cry out to God. It's okay to be upset. It is okay to be deeply disturbed about what's going on in your company or what's going on in our country. I, and truthfully, anything else would be fake, right? It just it would be fake. And by the way, if we feel that way, how do you think God feels about that moment? Because God sees even more clearly than we do. God is the one who, behind the scenes, he sees the insult. He sees the scheming. He sees the gossip. He sees who is cheating and who is cheating the system. He sees the injustice. He sees what is unfair. And if all that disturbs us, imagine how deeply it disturbs him. And so when we let our emotions mirror the moment, the truth is our emotions are being lined up with God's heart because he feels those same things. Now, the second way to respond is this, is that my response should be sincere and complete. Less than a hundred years before, before Esther rolls up on the scene, the prophet Joel writes this in Joel chapter two, beginning verse 12. He says, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. And underline this, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. Those are almost the exact same words that had you put a box around in the book of Esther just a few moments ago. A lot of biblical scholars think that the book of Esther was referring to this passage in the book of Joel by using almost identical language. It says, and, and I want you to underline this, rend your hearts and not your garments. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Now, look at that second part I had you underline, where it says, rend your hearts and not your garments. The reason I had you underline that is because God doesn't want you to miss something really important. And here's what he doesn't want you to miss. That it's the condition of your heart that matters most. See, the people of Joel's day, oh, they were in a similar situation. They were in a situation of great despair. And they had, were having all these emotional responses. Listen, but their hearts weren't in it for God. And so God was saying, look, I'm not interested in your outward appearance. Stop rending your garments. Rend your heart. Align your heart with me. Don't just put on a show. I don't care about that. What I care about is your heart. That's what God was saying to him. And listen, and sometimes our Heavenly Father allows us to face these deep emotional decisions and these dilemmas that we find ourselves in, not because God wants us to just feel conflict, not just because he wants us to get emotional, but he wants us to use that situation to turn to him. God allows us to have this conflict, not so that we can try to figure it out on our own, but so that we can turn to him and say, God, here's what's going on, and I don't know what to do, I need you. That's what he's saying. And that, yeah, go ahead. So listen, don't just rend your garments. Don't just put on that outward show. Rend your heart. Rend your heart. Cry out to God. Turn to him. In fact, return to him. Because he wants your heart more than anything. Look, let's be real. Our country is in a mess right now. I mean, it's a, it is a big mess. And listen, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, our country is in a mess. The future of our nation, the future of our country that our kids and our grandkids are gonna grow up in, like, it's in limbo. And by the way, it doesn't matter who gets elected in November, it's not going to fix it. But you know what, Will? If our nation would turn back to God. Yeah. 
if our nation would turn back to God, it would pretty much fix everything. It would fix it all. But listen, here's the thing. Our nation turning to God starts with us turning to God. It starts with you. Would you say that you follow God with all of your heart? Or just most of it? Or maybe just part of it? It's time to turn to God, to return to God with all of our heart. Whatever that looks like for you, and chances are you probably already know. You probably already know what God wants you to start doing or what he wants you to stop doing, but it's time to return to God with all of your heart. In fact, I'm going to give you a moment here in just a second to turn to God with all of your heart. But for some of you, it might mean that you give God your heart for the very first time. Maybe you have never given God your heart by never asking Jesus to come into your life to forgive you, to become a Christ follower. And if you're ready to do that today, maybe that's something you've been thinking about doing for a while. There's a prayer. It's in your message notes. You can use that as a sample prayer to pray, to become a Christ follower, to give God your heart for the very first time. And if you have already prayed that prayer, in just a moment, when we have a moment of silence, I want you to turn, to return to God with all of your heart, to say, God, whatever this is, I'm going to stop doing it. Whatever it is that I need to start doing, I'm going to start doing it. God, I am returning to you with all of my heart. And listen, the turning of our country starts with the turning of us. So right now, whether you're online or, or you know, here in person, I want everybody to bow your head, close your eyes right now. I'm going to give you just a few moments. You turn to God with all of your heart. Whatever you need to do, cry out to him, tell him. You're giving him your whole heart. And whatever it is that you're going to change, be specific about whatever that is and commit to him to change it by changing your heart. Do that right now. If you need to pray to become a Christ follower, then do that in this moment. Lord Jesus, we turn to you today with all of our hearts. No more outward appearances, no more like fake tears about it all. We turn to you with all of our hearts. And I ask that today would be the first domino that would fall in our whole nation starting to turn to you. But let it begin with us today, this morning. And so in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. All right. Let's go. Number three. And this is where we finally get to the point where Esther is facing her dilemma. And so let's ask this question. Number three, is this my defining moment? And maybe what happened just a second ago is your defining moment. But let's look at Esther's defining moment. In chapter four, beginning in thir verse 13, it says this. It says, then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the Jews. Basically saying, hey, Esther, don't think that you won't be killed along with every other Jew, because you will. For if you keep silent at this time and you don't basically tell the king what's really going on, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. You're all going to die. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Probably the most famous line in the entire book of Esther. This is literally the moment we've been building towards this whole time. And so we've got this young girl in this moment with literally the entire fate of the people on her shoulders. And basically her dilemma is this, is like, hey, do I go and tell the king that really he's a pawn in this plot to exterminate the Jews and kill me. But the dilemma is, and because for us this is like, well, of course you go to tell the king, like, duh. But the dilemma is, you, in, in Babylon, you can't just barge into the king's presence uninvited. 
In fact, if you just try to walk in on the king uninvited, you'll be immediately grabbed by the soldiers, carted off, and killed. And it doesn't matter, even if you're the queen, it'll happen to you. The king got rid of the last queen on a whim. He wouldn't care if Esther died as well. And so Esther's in this dilemma, like, what do I do? I'm deeply emotionally involved with the dilemma my people are in, but let, hello, I don't want to be killed either. And so God, what do I do? That was the dilemma that she was facing. It was her defining moment. Listen, all of us at one time, we felt this, like the same situation that Esther's in. We have felt like literally our entire future is balanced on one decision. And whichever way I go is gonna mark the rest of my life. And what makes it more difficult is that we might also be asking in that moment, like, God, where are you? Like, I am so emotional. I want to get this right. I can't afford to get this wrong. So, God, where are you in all this? Why are you so distant at the time when I need you the most? God, what am I supposed to do? Where are you in this moment? You know, I remember one time I was in, when I was in seminary, we were in class and we were actually discussing, not the book of Esther, but we were discussing the same dilemma. And we were discussing the dilemma of like, how do I know I'm in God's will if I can't feel God's presence? And my seminary professor said this, and I've never forgotten it. He said, look, if you believe that God is sovereign over the whole universe, the fact that you are here is proof that you are in the middle of God's will. Let me say it again. If you believe that God is sovereign over the whole universe, the fact that you are here is proof that you are in the middle of God's will. And as soon as he said it, I sat there in my chair and in my mind I thought, huh? I was like, wait, what? But the more we talked about it, and the more we discuss it in class, the more I realized he was right. That listen, if God truly does rule over the entire universe, which by the way, he does, and he is able to work through any situation, whether good or bad, which by the way, we know that he can, then the very fact that we were there, no matter how we got there, in that room, in that class, that day, the, just the fact that we were there is proof that we were right in the middle of God's will. Because no matter how we got there, God wanted us there. And the same is true for you. Listen. No matter how you got here, whether you're watching online or whether you're listening in person, no matter how you got here to church today, you are here, you are listening today because God wanted you here. And so you are right in the middle of where God wants you to be. And that doesn't apply to just church, it applies to your job. It applies to your neighborhood. It applies to your school. It applies to your friends. It applies to whatever activity that you are a part of. God has you where you are for a reason. And he's got a purpose in it. So listen, don't, don't get so hung up on, oh God, do you want me to, to choose A or do you want me to choose B? Or maybe there's other options. Maybe there's a C and maybe there's a D out there. I don't, God, what do you want me to do? And in those moments when God feels so distant, don't get so hung up on A and B. Get more hung up on the fact, God, you have me right here, right now, in this place, doing this thing. And so what is it you want from me now? And maybe the reason God is not giving you much discernment about what to do on A or B because God's like, look, I'm more focused on what you're doing now. And so get focused on what my purpose for you now, and I'll make the rest of it clear to you later on. And even if it's not clear, you just trust me that I am working silently and powerfully behind the scenes, and I will guide you. You don't need to stress about it so much because I love you. I've got a great future for you, but focus on where you are now. Because who knows that for such a time as this, as I have you there. Man, that's huge. And by the way, it takes so much pressure off. So don't miss it, which is why it's so important that we turn to God or return to him with all of our heart. That's big. All right, we're gonna wrap it up with this last question. Write this down. Are there others I can invite to join me? Are there others I can invite to join me? 
I, I've reprinted what Mordecai says to Esther there. He says, and who knows whether or not you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And Esther, she's got a pretty good idea what Mordecai wants her to do, so she gets it. But before she does, look at what she decides in, four, in chapter 4, 16. She says, go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa. That's the city, the capital city where she is. And hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And I and my young women will also fast as you do. So she's, she says basically, hey, go get as many people as you can. Join me and my, my girls because we are going to fast and pray about what God wants us to do. So one thing that you can do when you don't know what to do, get people around you, not to give you advice, but get them to start fasting and praying as you do. And this is something that doesn't get taught and doesn't get practiced nearly enough. But if we will begin to fast and pray about what God wants us to do in that moment right where we are, God will begin to make his will clear. And all of this comes to an amazing conclusion next week. So make sure you're here next Sunday. It's going to be good. Yeah. Bow your head, close your eyes, let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you got for us today and what you had for us today. And use us, Heavenly Father, to turn our nation to you as we turn to you with all of our hearts. Jesus, it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen.